I know there was a few members that were able to attend Norma Day's service today, and they were able to bring back some bulletins that are in the narthex. So if anybody would like um, to take one or take a look at that, uh, they're just in the narthex. And then I'll uh, make that announcement again on Sunday. So I think that's really the only thing new I have uh, to report. <laughs> okay. I would like to invite the congregation to please rise in body or spirit. And our service continues with hymn number 803, 803.
let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross, and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from the 52nd and 53rd chapters of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which, he, which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one form, one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of many people, of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured himself, he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let's read responsively Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and not human, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips, they shake their heads. Trust in the Lord, let the Lord deliver. Let God rescue him, if God so delights in him. Yet you are the one who drew me forth from the womb and kept me safe on my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Circle me, strong bulls of sound. They open wide their jaws at me like a slashing and roaring lion. All my bones are out of joy. The heart within my breath is melting My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth and you have laid me in the dust of death. Packs of dogs closed me in. A band of evildoers circles round me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones while they stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far away. O my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. 
Save me from the lion's mouth. For the horns of wild bulls you have rescued me. I will declare your name to my people. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor arbor the poor in their poverty. Neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. You satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. The dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted.
The second reading is from the 10th chapter of Hebrews. After the Holy Spirit says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after these days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord.
I'm going to ask, I'm going to invite the congregation to please remain seated for our gospel lesson. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the, so the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Ananias, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. Out, Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Ananias sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. 
Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against them. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify, crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he had claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went, out what is, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew and Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each so so soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus and saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. 
He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission so that he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For our Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This past Sunday, one of our scripture lessons taught us to have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. And to have a mind like that of Jesus Christ is to have a mind that trusts in the commandments of God. To have a mind like Christ means that we dedicate ourselves to being people who are quick to share the love of God. It means that we are willing to forgive those who sin against us. And it means that we speak out against sin while also not succumbing to hatred or feelings of revenge. And on Palm Sunday and Monday, Thursday, I spoke about how challenging it is to have a mind like Christ Jesus. Even the 12 disciples who were able to spend time with Jesus here on earth struggled with having a mind like their teacher. They had the the added advantage of being able to see his miracles firsthand. They were able to hear him speak and engage him in conversation. And yet even they had a difficult time developing a mind like Jesus. And we see that fact once again in our gospel lesson for this evening. In all four gospels, we see see that Jesus is perfectly obedient to the will of the Father. Now it's true that Jesus felt pain And he did not enjoy being put to death, but he never doubted the Father's plan. All four gospel writers make this point, although John, St. John, puts the most emphasis on this fact. He really kind of drives that point home. Now, as we read about the perfect obedience of Jesus, we also see that the disciples failed in placing their trust in God's plan. Very early on in this lesson, we find Judas betraying Jesus as he brings a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. Then we find Simon Peter, whose anxiety must be going up with each passing moment. Well, the first thing he does is cut off the ear of the high priest's slave. And then a few verses later, we find Peter denying the fact that he is a follower of Jesus. Well, even with the very disappointing behavior of the disciples, we find that our Lord Jesus continues to stay faithful to the Father's plan. 
when Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, asked Jesus if he's the king of the Jews, Jesus does not deny this claim. Instead, he responds to Pilate with a question. Pilate then asks Jesus what he has done, that his own people would hand him over. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Jesus turns the attention of the conversation to heaven, where Jesus will be crowned in glory at his ascension. Well, Pilate is not too interested in heaven. He says to Jesus, so you are a king. And Jesus answers him, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. So Jesus makes it clear here that he's far more powerful than the Jewish authorities and the Roman Empire. But he's allowing himself, he's allowing himself to be put to death because this was the reason why he was sent into the world. Jesus was sent into the world so as our first lesson says, he could be wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our inequities, and upon him would be the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. Jesus follows the Father's plan because both he and the Father love humanity. And God wants nothing more than for people to turn to him for healing and to, and to dedicate themselves to having a mind like the Son of God. Well, again, we see Jesus' love for humanity on full display here. Whether he's being interrogated by a high priest or the Roman governor, or being rejected by the common people, or being flogged by soldiers, or being nailed to a cross, Jesus remains faithful to the Father's plan to save humanity. Well, in verse 28, we are told that Jesus knew that all was now finished. So in order to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I am thirsty. So St. John informs us that Jesus said this to fulfill the scriptures. And that would be, he's referring to Psalm 22, verse 15, which we read tonight, and also Psalm 69, uh, verse 21. So Jesus definitely says these words to fulfill scripture. Now it was also very possible that he, was, that he actually was thirsty. So there's that. And there could be some other reasons why he said th these words. Again, he definitely said them to fulfill scripture. But it's possible there's more to it. Some theologians have argued that another reason that he said these words and he drank, that he drank the wine that was offered to him on the cross was because he finished the Passover meal on the cross, which further emphasizes the fact that Jesus is truly the new Passover lamb. So Jesus is definitely the new Passover lamb on the cross, but whether or not he finished the meal on the cross is something that we can debate. But he's definitely the Passover lamb. But that's something that's out there. You might, might come across that sometimes, so at some point, if you haven't already. Now, something else. So I, I was aware of that um, thought for several years now. But something else I came across this week for the very first time about these three words is that the religious community, the Missionaries of Charity, which was founded by Mother Teresa, that in all the covenants of this community, they have a crucifix on the wall with the words, I thirst, inscribed on them. This community believes that another reason why Jesus said these words 
is because he was saying that he was thirsty for souls. Now, I have never heard this explanation for these words bef before until, until this week. I read them in a, in a devotional book. And I would say that we could easily debate whether or not Jesus said, I am thirsty or I thirst on the cross because he was also making a statement about his thirst for souls. So we could, we could debate that. But what I would say is undeniable is that Jesus died on the cross because he was thirsty for souls. Because he wanted both Jews and Gentiles to seek his forgiveness, to know his perfect love, and to dedicate themselves to having a mind like his. There's no question that Jesus is thirsty for souls. What, qu what question does exist is how are we going to respond to Jesus? Well, hopefully our response is to say yes to the work of the Holy Spirit and embrace the love of Jesus. We should place our faith in God and trust that Jesus has truly repaired our relationship with the Father through his sacrifice on the cross. We should also trust that Jesus is still with us. In verse 34, we are told that one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood came, and at once blood and water came out. Now there is a scientific reason for why this happened, but the early church believed that the water and blood that flowed from Jesus, the early church believed that the water and blood that flowed from Jesus' side symbolized the waters of holy baptism and the blood of holy communion. Through our baptism, we receive new life. And, we are and then we are continually nourished by the blood, body and blood of Jesus through holy communion. So those are two of the ways Jesus remains with us. Through baptism and holy communion. We receive that new life at baptism, and then we are nourished throughout our life with the body and blood of Jesus through Holy Communion. It has also been cited that, uh, that water and blood came from Jesus' side to remind us that the church is the bride of Christ. As Eve came from the side of Adam, the bride of Christ, the church, comes from the side of the new Adam, Jesus Christ. Now we could debate some of this symbolism, but the fact remains that to but the fact remains that to place our faith in Jesus Christ means we also believe that he's still with us and that he helps us with our faith and he helps us to have a mind like his. But no matter what we think about all this symbolism, it's still true that Jesus continues to be with us. Now my final point for the evening is to have a faith, is to have faith in our Lord Jesus and to dedicate ourselves to having a mind like his means we also share in his thirst for souls. Peter and the other disciples do not always come out looking all that heroic or even faithful in the four Gospels. Sometimes they do well, other times not so much. But with God's help, they eventually become strong disciples who spend the rest of their lives thirsty to bring souls to Christ. And you and I share in that same calling. Not only should we want to be united to Christ, but we should want our neighbors to also be united with our Lord. The missionaries of charity that I talked about earlier remind, remind themselves every day of that calling. They understand that they are called to help Jesus with his thirst for souls. And whether or not we may agree with their interpretation of the words, I am thirsty or I thirst, 
I think all Christians can agree that Jesus is thirsty for souls. And he calls all of his disciples to help their neighbors to know his saving action on the cross. The events of the passion of Jesus Christ are a true story of human sin and God's love for his disobedient creation. Good Friday teaches us about who God truly is. That God is filled with love and compassion. That God did not give up on humanity, but instead found a way to invite us back into his family, while also showing us how to have a mind like his. Good Friday should teach us that we can trust God and that our Lord Jesus continues to thirst for souls. The cross has so much to teach us. And one lesson is that, is that it is an invitation. The cross is an invitation. It is an invitation to come to know God, to be saved by God, and to join God in his saving work. Amen. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for Elizabeth Eaton and William Goal, our bishops, for our pastor, for the members of St. Mark's Church, and all servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church, and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us prepare for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. 
Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children, and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for our sisters and brother who, brothers who share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. Here are prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment, fulfillment of the covenant promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, bring an end to interreligious strife and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians, and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. and your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all things for which our Lord would have, have us ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And our service continues with the solemn reproaches. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I led you out of slavery into freedom and delivered you through the waters of rebirth, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. Forty years I led you through the, de- the desert, 
feeding you with manna on the way. I saved you from the time of trial and gave you my body, my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I led you on your way in a pillar of cloud and fire, but you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I guided you by the light of the Holy Spirit, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I planted you as my fair, fairest vineyard, for you brought forth bitter fruit. I made you branches of, vine, of the vine and never left your side, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I poured out saving water from the rock but you gave me vinegar to drink. I poured out my life and gave you the new covenant in my blood, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I gave you a royal scepter, but you gave me a crown of thorns. I gave you the kingdom, and crowned you with eternal life, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I struck down your enemies, but you struck my head with a reed. I gave you my peace, but you draw the sword in my name and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I opened the waters to lead you to the promised land, but you opened my side with a spear. I washed your feet as a sign of my love, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I lifted you up to the heights, but you lifted me high on a cross. I raised you from death and prepared for you the tree of life, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I grafted you into my people Israel, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I came to you in the least of your brothers and sisters, but I was hungry and you gave me no food, thirsty and you gave me no drink, a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. 